Oh, turn it on, Greg. Well, let's let's start in prayer first. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for this this night and this time together. I thank you for being present with us, your children, and for teaching us through your word. I ask that my words be your words, Father, and that um, you show us the things that you would have us see this evening. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, when I was kind of seeking the Lord on this, I, I felt like he wanted me to talk about who does God say you are. Um, I, I, in my life, have been called many things by myself, by other people, um, and I feel I feel like in God's word is is where we can find what He says about us. So um, He led me He led me to a lot of scriptures. So that's that's where we find what God says about us is in the scriptures. So I feel like if we if we can get an internal understanding of what God says about who we are, we can be who He wants us to be. And um, and then step into the things that he would have for us. He'll make room. Do we have to pray over? <laughs> no. So he he had me start with that God created us, and so in Genesis one twenty six, I use the Amplified for almost all of these. That's the Bible I have at home. God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame beast, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So God made us in his likeness. He, he started out by making us look like him. Um, he, he did that knowing, at least what I felt like he showed me, is he did that knowing he was going to, to adopt us into his family um, to share his inheritance. And, and if you look at the earthly families we have, we have traits that are similar to each other. We look like each other. We, we have the same tendencies. We, some people sound like each other. So um, he made us in his image to be in, in part of his family. And then he gave us dominion at that time over all of the earth, um, already setting us up to have authority over the, the coming ruler of this world. Like he already gave us authority when he created us. So um, in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil to give you hope in your final outcome. So I don't believe God God makes mistakes. He made us on purpose. He made us with an intention. Um, he, he was using Greg's phone today to to shed light on the creation the creator and the creation for me. When when something in the in the earthly realm goes wrong, we we go to the creator to, to see how to fix it. Greg recently his phone broke and we went into Verizon and they were like, I'm sorry, can't help you. So he had to send it to LG. He had to send it to the maker of his phone to get it fixed. So um, the creator wants us to come to him to be fixed. Like that's, that's where we have to go. He made us, he knows how we work, he knows, he knows what's in us and he knows what we need. So I was thinking a lot about um, I, my identity prior to understanding. Like I always, I was raised Catholic, so I always believed there was a God, but I didn't know God. And so my identity used to come through control. I, I was a single parent with a little child, and so not necessarily controlling people, but being able to control my own existence. If my house is clean, if things were just so, if if I could be in control of what was going on, then then I was okay. So um, that was how I used to kind of view my identity in life before I saw, before I found God and, and got to know him and learned the freedom that I get to have through that. You, you were going to share to you about like base, base stuff here, your identity. Yeah, I guess uh, for 
20 plus years, I guess, my identity I, would have been in accomplishments with the bass guitar. And so I guess that's where, where I was. <clears throat> Do, do you guys feel like you ever had a time in your life where your identity came from something like outside of God, that there was something in your life that like that's what you identified with? Do you, would you share? That? Similar to you, control. If everything was going good, felt like I was under, had things under control, then life was good. But then when it wasn't, I was floundering wasn't in panic and didn't feel at peace. Lost my peace, definitely. What, what about any of you? Have you had, a, had something in your life that like you, you drew your identity from that wasn't God? Well, guys get uh, their identity from what they do, what their work is. I, my identity for a long time was, you know, it's a logger. I was a logger. So I've had shifting identities <laughs> over, the, over years. the years. Well, for those of you who join us, I'm talking about who God says we are. And so um, I started off with that God says he's our creator. He created us. I'm in the wrong class. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where he led me next in the scripture was that God calls us. He calls us back to him. Um, Matthew 22, 14 says, For many are called, they're invited and summoned, but few are chosen. And I believe God calls all of us. Um, 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, He wishes that all men should be saved and know the truth, not just some of them. So um, I think that God would spend our whole lives calling us back to him. Some people, I, I was 32 before I felt like I, I answered, I guess, but I think he's always calling. I feel like he called my whole life to me, whether it's, oh, please don't do that. Don't go there. Don't make that choice. Like he, he was always calling to me in ways even if I didn't recognize his voice at that time. Due, due to where I was, so um, I wish I had heard him sooner. <laughs> 32 years for me went by. Um, a lot of bad choices can be made in 32 years, so I wish I had, had heard him calling sooner. Second Peter 3 9 says, The Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he promises, according to some people's conception of slowness, but he is long suffering extraordinarily patient towards you, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. So I, I just truly believe that he, he will call out to us our whole lives, and I feel like we'll either answer or unfortunately end, end this life without getting to know him. Some people, unfortunately, I think hit the end without getting to know the Father and what he has for us. Um, to share something there? Yeah. Um, in, the, in the men's meetings we'll have with Pastor Jerry, that, that right there has left me with a, a lot of wonder because um, the last men's meeting that I remember we were talking about, can you lose your salvation? And uh, I took a class in high school called Humanities, and by the end of it, I had just decided God couldn't possibly exist. And I spent 10 years like making people at work cry, like just going out of my way to, to try to prove God couldn't exist. And <clears throat> um, I started getting a bunch of, bunch of sponsorships with music companies, and it was, it was odd to me that all of the owners of the companies were Christian, and they all started praying for me, and all these things started happening. And so long story short, all of a sudden I just – all this stuff happened where I, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly deny that God existed. And so just like you're saying where, um, you're saying you just, he'll keep calling out to you, long suffering of these things in Second Peter 3, 9. That was, that's just a big thing for me, I guess. I wasn't prepared to talk. <laughs> it's all good. And stuff.
Um, like I said in, in the front at the beginning of this, like he, we find out who we are in the scripture. So he did give me quite a few scriptures <laughs> to share. So bear with me as I uh, read some of these. But I just felt like they were all kind of pertinent to what he was he was wanting to express. So um, Ephesians two nineteen says, "Therefore you are no longer outsiders, exiles, migrants, excluded from the rights of citizens." But you now share citizenship with the saints, God's own people, consecrated and set apart for him, and you belong to God's household. And when I read that one, I just um, was touched by it's it's not just that he calls out to, to us, he, he brings us back home. Like he, he wants to adopt us into, into his family. The Bible uses the word adopt. And and we were having a, a conversation with the children one day. We have step family, and so I was telling them, "You're not mine, but I chose. I chose you. I chose to have you to have you come here." And I feel like that's what God does. It's adoption is a choice. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't just have you and he's stuck with you. Like He chooses to call us to call us all to Him. And I, I just think there's a special kind of love in that. That. Um, at least for me, I feel touched because I know there's times when I don't feel very loving or love myself. So to know that he loves me enough to choose me, to, to call me back to himself, um, for me is pretty special. Hey, you know what's awesome about adoption <clears throat> is that um, God may have chosen you, but your fellow siblings did not, so they are stuck with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. That's true. <laughs> Um, in Romans 28 through 8, 28 through 30, he says, We are assured and know that God being a partner in our labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called, he's calling us according to his design and purpose. So he doesn't just call us back to him. He calls us with a plan for our life. He already has a purpose. For those that he foreknew, he also destined from the beginning to be molded into the image of his son, that we might become the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, wow. I had this written down. I'm like, Oz talked about this on Sunday. Um, and those whom he thus foreordained, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So it wasn't just, I created you, I'm going to see what happens. It was, you know, his whole intention was for us to be like Christ, to look, to look like his son. He justified us. He made us right. He, he calls us with a purpose in mind. Um, sorry, just looking at my notes. So... When he calls, um, like I said, I felt like for 32 years I didn't, I didn't really hear. I'm, I know there. I look back now and I know, I know he was there. I just didn't recognize, recognize him. And so, um, unfortunately for me, I, I finally decided to respond to God when I had been second divorced, and at my wits' end, sitting on a couch one night, just finally asking God, what am I supposed to do with this mess? I don't know what to do with it. And that was the first time I felt like, since I responded, he responded again. Like, I felt like I could hear him, and, and that, like, flipped a switch for me because I didn't know you could have that kind of relationship with God. <clears throat> Growing up Catholic, and I'll, I'll say that loosely because we weren't, like, really practicing Catholic, but... um. I didn't, I had a lot of legalism in my mind about how I was supposed to get to relate to God. So um, it took me 32 years to cry out, to cry back and, and for him to, to respond. And now I've got this wonderful relationship that I didn't know I could, could have back then. So do, do any of you have stories about how it took you a while, or like when you finally responded, because because when God calls us, He can call and call and call, but we have to 
to respond to that. If the phone keeps ringing and we don't answer it, it will just keep ringing. So do you guys have, any of you have something you'd like to share about a time when maybe you? Yeah, <laughs> I suppose I will. Um, I, I had, I've been, I've been saved my whole life. I don't even remember when I got saved. It was probably really early on. But um, I had just slowly, and I had, it, it didn't even really dawn on me that I sort of just left the church and left God behind when I got married. And my ex-husband wasn't saved, and he, he did then become saved, but wasn't saved when I met him. And we had, like, all of our life going on. I had Desmond, and I was pregnant with Decker, very pregnant with Decker. And it was, it's like, a hot summer day, and I mowed my lawn. It was July. And I mowed my lawn. I mean, Decker was born at the end of July, so I was super duper pregnant. And then I went inside to, and we had three dogs and two car payments and a house and a house payment. And he wanted to buy a Harley. And I was like, fine, you know, whatever. Just done fighting with him about it. And um, I was weirdly nesting because I was pregnant <laughs> and sitting on the floor and lining. I had a really old house in the old part of town by the cathedral, just a couple of blocks from my parents. And I was lining all my drawers and my cabinets because you have to do that before you have a baby. <laughs> it's totally unrealistic. But I was super pregnant with Decker, and my ex-husband had been doing lots of stuff wrong. And I'd been, I, he, he was creating a ton of drama in the way that ex-husbands can. And so I was throwing up a lot every day, and I'd lost almost 20 pounds. And this was, you know, July, and I was having Decker, and they wanted me to decide if I needed to go in for nutrition and all this stuff. And um, I'm sitting on the floor, and I'm like, you know, God, um, I love you, and I'm not a quitter. I'm married. I'm in it to win it. Like, we're doing this forever. My mom's from a giant family, like 300 people. And I'm, <laughs> hundreds of people, hundreds of people. She's there's hundreds of people, and I'm like there's like three divorces. I'm one of three divorces in their family. Ooh. Like it doesn't happen in our families. Like we're like I said, I'm in it to win it, God. I'm not gonna not do this. But if this is what my married life is gonna be, I'm I don't want it. I'm done. And so I was like, you need to make it happen and fast. And I just in my mind was like, before I have this baby. And lo and behold, it was done before I had Decker. We moved out the week I had Decker. We sold our house. The closing date was the end of August. I mean, I wasn't even back to work yet. It was done. And we sold our house for $50,000 more than we spent on it, literally weeks before the market crashed. Oh. Weeks. I mean, only God could have done that for us. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, and we sold it. I don't even think was it 24 hours that it was up and posted. I don't even think it was 24 hours that it was on the open market. It was lined in the drawers. That yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was definitely the drawer liner. <laughs> and um, it was, you guys. It was. I loved my house. It was hard to give it up, but um, you know, it it was 880 square feet, and it was 100 years old. So the fact that we made that much money and that we we didn't go upside down in our payments. I mean, we had the world's most stupid home loan. Oh, it just gives me a, it hurts my head to even think that we signed the home loan that we had um, because everybody was signing zero down and all yeah. this wonky stuff. And um, I, I had a new car. I'm not a 35-year-old car, a 30-year-old car, but a new car, a Land Cruiser that my grandpa bought for me. I mean, he got just, in only the way that he can, um, just relieved everything in that situation, and and there there literally wasn't a way I would have survived it. There was no way Decker would have survived it either, if God hadn't stepped in. Because um, Decker's delivery was off the charts crazy too, and so there was. And if if he didn't make it through it, I definitely wouldn't have made it through it. Um, so in in a way that only God can, He just came back in and immediately, you know, rescued the situation and changed everything. Um, so, you know, I'm forever grateful, but I think even when you're not uh, not necessarily doing all the right stuff, he's gonna, he's definitely the king of, uh, of the rescue, for sure. Yeah, I had a moment when my kids were little, 
things were tough as it was, and I just had a moment where I was saying, God, I know life is hard, but it doesn't have to be this hard. Mm -hmm. And that, right about shortly after that, things started happening <clears throat> that went through the process, you know. But, like, your identity thing for me was, before I was a parent, just it was all about me. But when you start, especially being a single parent, you know, we can relate to that, that then your priorities change, you know, and I, you make it about them, and it gave me a perspective about what God sees in us, you mm -hmm. know, and now that they're out of the house, <clears throat> trusting that they're okay in what they're doing, you know, because before I was there, but now I'm not, so... It's super easy to make, as when you're a single parent, it's super easy to make your entire identity about creating these humans that are going to be <laughs> functional and not murderers and not end up in prison. And I mean, you're just like, your whole life is like these tiny humans that, yeah. you know, you, it's easy to make them everything. And I used to come home and I only had my boys. And I would come home from church and I remember just obsessing. I'd be like, oh my gosh, Carla didn't even look at Decker. She didn't even think he was cute. You know, like, <laughs> just like random stuff. And then I'd be like, I need to get out of the house. I need to like do something different here. Because I would, I would just get like obsessive and be like, I would mull stuff over for hours, you know, like potty training or food or this or that. And I would just get to the point where I would worry it. Not necessarily worry, but just focus on it to where there was nothing else going on in my life. And I would find someone at work and I would just attack them. Like vocally, I'd be like, ah, visiting with someone for, <laughs> forever. And then I'd be like, oh my gosh, I need to get out of the house and like cultivate who I am not a parent of these two, you know, because you it, it can consume you. Even with the best intentions, it can absolutely consume you. You just gave me an interesting thought when you said, like, now that you're out of the house, you, you worry about them, you know, out on their own. And I'm like, I'm sure that's how God feels about us all the time. But I never, I never really thought about it because our kids, we haven't had a kid leave the house yet. We're about to in May, but we still have them all at home. So I haven't had to have that worry yet of, are they okay when I'm not there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was kind of that way when they first left, you know, it, it's it's getting better, but it, and Jill, having a praying mom saved my bacon. Yeah, <laughs> she saved my bacon so, a lot, yeah. And I just, there was a moment a few years ago where I just had this, well, I had a moment where I just knew that I was living out her prayers for me, so. Can I say something? Uh, <clears throat> I got saved on a Friday night in 19, December 1974, probably the third week. And I was looking for a job. I was in Bozeman at the time. I was living in an 8 by 30 trailer with my wife and one kid. We were married three years then, and Aubrey was born that July. And uh, she's the first of four. Next three were boys. I, I, I didn't know the Lord then, so maybe he brought them into my family. Because she gives me the hardest time anyway. Yeah, and uh, when I was there, I I was reading Satan is, well, is Alive on, uh, and Well on Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I didn't really get into the book, but I was reading it because a friend of mine, he was kept telling me about Jesus. I said, I'm tired of hearing about this, so just give me whatever book you want me to read, and I'll read it. So I took the book home, and uh, was reading it. My wife was over there with her baby, and uh, she was having dinner there. I had to go to work that night in <coughs> lifeguarding at the Bozeman Hot Springs pool. That's how we paid our rent, because I didn't have a job. So I worked it out with Charlie, the owner, and he put me to work around there. But it didn't provide any groceries enough. So I, <coughs> I, uh, <coughs> I was reading this part where we're on trial. And Satan is the prosecutor, God the Father is the judge, and Jesus is my defense attorney. And Satan's laying it all out for 
God and he's saying, you have to judge him guilty. I know I was guilty. Yeah, but I didn't want God to fix it. And then the more Jesus got into it, he said, Father, he determined me guilty. But Jesus stepped in and says, the price is already paid for my, by my dying on the cross and spending two days and nights in hell. And I just realized at that time that Jesus was a hero. I was always kind of a, a hero worshiper. I read football stories and, and baseball stories, so the sports I liked. And then uh, I, I read Congressional Medal of Honor recipients' words. And uh, I said, Jesus is a greater hero than they were. Because they just died to their individual teammate or their team, but he died for us all. And so I said, Jesus, if you're real, provide me a job, will you? And my wife came home before I went uh, to work, and she said, you had two job calls. I said, <laughs> what? Yeah, at Jill's house, they called somebody called you twice. Uh, some person, two, two jobs. One, a big sky, a security guard paying $630 a month. This is 1974 now. <laughs> 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 you want to sell life insurance in New York life. I did not want to do that. So I, I took the job at, at Big Sky. I worked there from that December till March and then let me go. Meanwhile, I lost the front tooth because somebody had knocked it out because they didn't like me. But I had pounded them anyway, and gave them a caboose, and I took them outside. And that's, 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 that's not the to the story. But after that, I accepted Jesus, and I turned my life over to him. I tried to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit after that for two years. And uh, I, I just I couldn't. I, I got it, but I didn't claim I did, because it did sound like gibberish. You know, I, so I denied I had it. <laughs> and uh, then after 1979, a pastor here in town led <clears throat> me to the baptism, and, and I got it then, and I speak in tongues now, and, and I praise God for that. And that's been my life all along. So I've been here a long time, and I am 72, going on 73 next month. And I feel my wife left me in 2015. She died of cancer on July 25th. So I miss her, and I don't know what else to say, but yeah, I, I still miss her. I don't have the problems you guys are talking about. Because I let my kids, I always raised my kids. I showed them what to do, but they always fought me and everything. So I said, you want to fight me? Go out in the world and fight it. Because that's where I learned. And they're all happy. Alex is in the Army. Lincoln's selling insurance around town. Or he's got Great Falls in his territory. Chance is working at Free Text Concrete. My daughter, Aubrey, is in Texas. So... Uh, I guess they're all happy. They don't bug me, so they're not around. Well, I think I think it's awesome that your story. Thank you for sharing that, Bud. I I love that God will try to to meet every one of us where we're at, where we need to be found, whether it's through a book or sitting on a couch or you know he just he will he will seek and seek and seek and seek us out until. Like I said earlier, we either answer or, or unfortunately, we haven't. The next um, thing that God showed me is after he calls us, he chooses us. God chooses us. In Matthew twenty two fourteen, it says, I believe the few that are chosen are the believers. This, Sorry, I'm like reading my own stuff here. This is not what the verse says. But I believe that the few who are chosen are the believers who answer the call. So we have a part to play. In that, um, we can't step into to God's plan for us if we don't step into relationship with Him. So, 
Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 says, Even as in his love he chose us, he actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in his sight, even above reproach before him in love. So he, he wanted us, he created us, he called us back to himself, and then... I believe once we respond, he cho he chooses us. It says he chose us from the beginning. He always had a plan, but I don't think that we get to to walk in that unless we respond, because we won't know what it is. So, I think when it says the few are chosen, I think it's because if you think of the world as a whole, a few answer the call. Not everybody answers that call to him. So. I think there's a chosen destiny for everybody. We just don't all decide to, to walk into it and walk it out with him. <clears throat> Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's own handiwork, recreated in Jesus Christ and born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined for us, taking the paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. And these are all in the Amplified. I love the Amplified Bible. So, so he chose a life for us before, you know, before he made us. He knew us and he chose it. Um, I know that in, in my life, what I feel like he has chosen for me is not something I would have chosen for myself. Um, when, I, when I married Greg and we had the store downtown, Greg one day came to me and said that he felt like he wanted to do marriage stuff. And I thought, oh, marriage stuff. Like, I, <laughs> I'll help you, I guess, if you want If you want me to help you do that, I'll come with you and, you know, you can do marriage stuff. That's fine. I, I'd been married twice before. I had failed twice before. Um, I thought, who... Who would want to listen to me talk about marriage? Like, I, I obviously don't know much because it didn't work very well. The, you, know, you know what the not The first to do. two times. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> very true. So I, I was very confused by that at first. I just thought, who on earth would want to hear anything I had to say about marriage? Like, you know, I thought it was... Um, thought God was foolish, which sounds weird to say out loud, but I just thought, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> nobody wants to listen to that. I, you know, I thought, why? Why me? And I've learned that he, he chooses the things that confound so that you can see his face and not mine. Mm -hmm. So um, after doing this for seven years, it's it's changed for me. I now have a heart and a love for it, but it, I, I always... Felt like like if I, my feet were out, like he was pushing me, like my feet were dug in. I was I did not want to do that. And then at first we only wanted to do the fun stuff. If we were gonna do marriage, we just wanted to do like the fun small groups and the happy laughy, you know, laugh your way to a better marriage. That's what we were where we were gonna settle. But God kind of had a he chose a different path for us. That wasn't a path I would have chosen. But you know, God knows better. I feel like then he chose a life for me that I never would have chosen, but it's been more rewarding, I think, than a life I ever could have chosen mm -hmm. for myself. So, do you have anything to add about being chosen for marriage ministry? <laughs> I'm sure I could talk for hours, but <clears throat> I don't have anything in particular. I could just get started okay. and go for it. Oh, that's all good. I just. <laughs> Do, do you guys have areas in your life that you feel like, like God chose for you, things that you're, Michael, you do? Well, okay, it, it started in uh, um, June 19th of 2009 when I got down on my knees in my jail cell and asked God to please take away my obsession for drugs and uh, to please bless my life. Fast forward to today, he has blessed my life. I uh, completed my sentence. Got re, uh, got off parole, had no trouble with the law since then. I am now in the H and I panel group of Narcotics Anonymous and hosting a meeting weekly in the pre-release here in Montana and mm. Helena. So I've gone from this side of the fence to that side of the fence, oh and 
you know, if you would have asked me before this all happened, I, I, was, I was lost. But God, had a, God was with me through all my life. I can look back now and see that. You know, now that I believe in miracles, I know it was all but a miracle. If you would have looked at my life statistically, there's no way I should be walking on this earth. But, you know, God was with me the whole time. And now my life is blessed. My life is full. And uh, I do service work for him. I call it service work that I never even realized that I would be doing. And it's just all falling into my lap. Yeah. You know, and I know it's only through his power that I'm able to do this. Mm -hmm. awesome. Anybody else want to share? There are things you've been chosen into doing, but you now walk out with the Lord. When I was um, in my college age and a little before that, I thought the only thing I could ever be was a teacher. And, uh, and I, uh, and actually my father, one day he came by me when I was working with a student. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Sharon, bless you as a teacher. You know, that really was just the Holy Spirit just, uh, I, had, I felt intoxicated with the presence of the Spirit. It was so overwhelming. I hadn't thought of it that way as a blessing or a calling. I just thought, this is really fun. I like doing this. Right on. And then um, when my husband passed away, and the three corporations that he worked passed away, and um, I was left on the books with just income from the Social Security. And I had never been involved in the work he did, the land development, and all that that involved. And all of a sudden, my path just turned over here and started going down here. It was so brand new. And all I could think of, this like Joe's mantle fell on me to finish what he had to, to follow what he was starting. So then I heard someone uh, preach a sermon, and he said, the Lord just told me he wants me to stop thinking that there's only one project I can work on at a time. <laughs> and it just blessed my heart. And I, and I think that's good to know. He, he can have us going several directions at the same time, because he loves us right, and he's full of impossibilities and all of that. So, so now instead of teaching, which I did from 66 to um, 2015, I'm a, I'm, I'm a <laughs> 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 And I, 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 also, I almost lost my house this past year. I, that's what people say to me. And they gave me all kinds of advice about what to do, and I didn't know about that either. Um, but the Lord just gave, how does the Lord use his word? It is all written. Some other person walked it out, you know, and it's right here. And, and you go walking in, and the Lord says, now that's what I'm going to do for you. And you think, yeah. like Hezekiah <clears throat> or Gideon. Or and as you read the word, you literally relive that, that intervention by the Lord. I found that God uses his word like that. And so, and just, um, just this week, I know for sure I'm not going to lose my house. Oh, and I lived a God. whole year. I knew it in the spirit. I knew it in the word. Because God told me from Hezekiah's life. There would not be an arrow shot against this house or a siege ramp erected. And I stood on that, and I stood on that, and I stood on that. And things were whipping around and here and there. No. Nope. No arrow, no siege yeah, ramp. And, and all of a sudden, out of the clear, a fellow who owed my husband money, which wasn't due until um, 2018, came forward and wanted to pay it early. 
That's good. Oh, yes. And that was in December 1st. And it was December 1st last year when I ran out of money. So it was a whole year. Where is your house at? You can kind of see it up in the garage there. Up by that George Parker Street. We bought two mining claims way back in 83. And uh, they were 20 acres each. And they were landlocked. <laughs> and then my husband had a thing about making. He had, he was called by God and, and he could do that. And he made a lot and he gave a lot. Praise God. But when he left, he, he left all these unfinished projects and also some debt that this was going to do this for this and this thing. It, it, well, he wasn't um, uh, unwise, but he left. <laughs> and so, anyhow, I think, I'm, I'm not sure why I'm telling you this. Um, it's, it's how God led me and how he's leading me now. And yet somehow in my heart, I think I'll be teaching again. I, I worked with uh, home educators from 1988 on, and uh, especially with uh, children that the school said can't learn. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's kind of hard for a child to learn if he's not being taught. You know, I, I just learned so many things. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and the Lord blessed me with insight, and I would go and live with families even for a month or so to, to show the mom and dad how this is how you can teach him. And that's a whole wonderful story what the Lord showed me. And how I have a, a, a curriculum that it's, it's like the forefathers, how they taught. And they didn't teach subjects. They taught the language to children, and the child taught himself what he was interested in. The, the only time a child would be sent outside of the school, I mean, outside of the home, this is before Massachusetts <coughs> decided public education should be the way to go. But the only time would be in, in certain areas like engineering, the mathematics necessary for engineering, or in languages like Latin and Hebrew and Greek and all that. But all the education came right in the home it was just English. How to how to speak it and how to write it, how to spell it, and how to read it, which was in that order. And it was really good. So the Lord led me on a path, showed me how they did it. And it's not in any of my graduate, even Christy graduate school, mm -hmm. not in any of my texts do they teach what should have been taught to all of us who want to go out there and be a teacher. Mm -hmm. and so I wrote it all out again. So, anyway. And I was uh, contacted Bill Winston. I don't know if you know who Bill Winston is. He's, he's working with the. the, the Negro, the black American population in um, Chicago and in Atlanta, so. and he wants to take these children off the streets and put them in here. He calls them citadels. Uh, he, he can't. He doesn't want to take them away from the children, but pretty much they already are. They're just out on the street. So he's going to have you can stay here and we'll clothe you and we'll feed you and we'll educate you and and we'll teach you how to to be a warrior in the kingdom. He was chosen for that, that kind of, that's awesome. And so it's I, wonderful. I contacted him, I said, I have an English program that will work. And so I'm waiting to hear on that. That's yeah. wonderful. So, okay. Oh, no, that's you're right, you're a, fine. Quite a faith builder. I mean, I remember a year ago, um, you shared that, I don't know if you shared it with everybody, you shared it with me, but, and I think I prayed with you about that. Do you remember? Did I, did I actually pray with you? I remember praying about that, but I don't remember if I prayed with you about that. But, and about your home and everything like yeah. that a year ago. But I was. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Is your home 49? Maybe it is. That's how I'll finish from yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah, yesterday we drove to your house. Sorry, this is totally off the subject. No, well, it's been listed in the Jefferson County 
Always, they're going to auction it off. Yeah, that, that was, was your home. Share sale. But that but you said you saved your home. Hmm. Yeah. Didn't you say you saved your home? Yeah. It, the sale's the thirty first. The the schedule. But it's not going to be held. You believe in in God. Yeah. All right, we won't buy it. Faith. We're at our faith. The other. That's good. Wow. Uh -huh. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the fourth area God showed me was he creates us, he calls us, he chooses us, and then he seals us to himself. Acts 7, 8 says, this goes back, but it's talking about that God made a covenant with Abraham in the old, old covenant with circumcision. And so in, in the new covenant, um, he seals us with the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, And God, you also, who have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings of your salvation, and have believed in and adhered to and relied on him, were stamped with the seal of the long-promised Holy Spirit. That spirit is the guarantee of our in anticipation of its full redemption and our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. So... Ephesians talks about how how we get sealed by him. And, and when you when you seal something, I always think of like the old movies where they would steal like seal like a rubber stamp on a letter or something. It's like it it showed ownership and you wanted to open it, you know, until it was delivered to the proper person. So um, he creates us. He calls us. He chooses us into his family. And I looked at the ceiling as like when he talks about adoption. Like the Holy Spirit is kind of his, his mark on us that, that we belong to him. And it's it's not like an external mark either like on a letter. It's, it's an internal mark that, that we get to carry. Um, he, he showed me, I'm going to read through this really fast due to time. He showed me an ax. He took me to the story of Saul how the progression of, of all of these things occur. So I'm just going to read Saul's story. It says, Meanwhile, Saul, still drawing his breath hard from threatening and murderous desire against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and requested of him letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any men or women belonging to the way of Jesus, he might bring them bound with chains to Jerusalem. Now as he traveled on, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. Then he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is dangerous, and it will turn out badly for you if you keep kicking against the goad. So the Lord calls out to him, and he answers. Trembling and astonished, he asked the Lord, What do you desire me to do? The Lord said to him, But arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were accompany, accompanying him were unable to speak for terror, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Then Saul got up from the ground, but though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was unable to see for three days, and he neither ate nor drank anything. Now there was in Damascus a disciple named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. So once again, the Lord's seeking somebody out. He's calling to him, and Ananias answers. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go. Go to the street called Straight, and ask at the house of Judas for the man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying there, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias enter and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many people tell of this man, especially how much evil and what great suffering he has brought on your saints at Jerusalem. Now he is here and has authority from the high priest to put in chains all who call upon your names. All who call upon your name. So the Lord instructed him and, and chose him to, to go somewhere and fulfill a purpose for, for him. Ananias, he did. So the Lord said to him, go, for this man is the chosen instrument. He's naming, he's naming Saul, who will be Paul. He chose him. He's going to be a chosen instrument for the Lord. Of mine to bear my name. 
before the Gentiles and kings and the descendants of Israel. For I will make clear to him how much he will be afflicted and must endure and suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias left and went into the house, and he laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you along the way by which you came here, has sent me that you may recover your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He seals him with the Holy Spirit. And instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he recovered his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. And after he took some food and was strengthened for several days, he remained with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately in the synagogues, he proclaimed Jesus, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the very man who harassed and overthrew and destroyed in Jerusalem those who called upon this name? And he has come here for the express purpose of arresting them and bringing them in chains before the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and continued to confound and put in confusion the Jews who lived in Damascus by comparing and examining evidence and pro proving that Jesus is the Christ. He, he created Saul because he, he existed, but he called to him. He chose him. He, he, you know, he gave him a purpose. He sealed him. And this story really kind of touched me in the fact that he took this man that was a persecutor and murderer of, of Christians, and a well-known one. It wasn't like kind of a, he was a well-known persecutor, and, and turned him into, you know, changed his name to Paul, and he wrote, you know, half of the New Testament. He, you know, he turned him into this great man of God. He used this thing that confounded people, so they had to know that it was God. So, um, when Greg and I <clears throat> were first feeling like we were called into marriage ministry, I, I was having all of those questions, like, what are you doing? And God sent us to 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. And it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So I feel like God on purpose will, will take people who have been somewhere, maybe on, on not the good end of things, and turn their life around so that they can go out and comfort other people who, who unfortunately are going to be where they've been. So... Um, <clears throat> Who, who does God say that I am? I'm, I'm his creation. He's called me. He's chosen me. He's sealed me in his family. But he also says that I'm a marriage pastor even though I failed. You know, he, he says that I'm a mom of all of these children that don't belong to me. He, he says a lot of things about me that I never, I never would have said about myself. Um, so who does God say you are? I keep saying it. Yeah. Keep adding to it. A comedian? I'm a comedian. You're a comedian. Because <laughs> I'm not fun. <laughs> yeah, you tell us you have a great sense of humor. 